I'm not sure what's easier, doing it live or doing it, uh, doing it recording, so at least I can correct my mistakes when I'm recording, <laughs> which are many and varied. Uh, but we'll start, those who join us later on will join us later on. And um, we'll start with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for bringing us together. Lord, we pray that you help us not to melt in this hot day today. Lord, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always acceptable to you, my Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Right, why I'm doing acts. If you take a look at your little stained glass window. This is a stained glass window from Norwich Cathedral. Um, we were on holiday, went into Norwich Cathedral. There on the front, statue of St Benedict, statue of... I think Julian of Norwich, who's a, a mystic. Um, okay, fine, no problem. Go into the church, through all the touristy bits, to the bit they direct you into the cathedral itself. So you're walking in to the house of God. Straight in front of me, three bookshelves. You know those rotary type ones that we have. And I thought, ah, what are they selling in this cathedral? Jokes for over 40s. Jokes for, jokes for over 40s, jokes for over 50s. And I, I looked for something that was Christian. And the best I found was God's Little Book of Calm. Later on, I looked around the bookshop. You have to do the whole cathedral first, then you do the gift shop. Well, that's the rules. So we did the whole, and I went to the gift, the gift shop afterwards. They had statues of little children kissing, or of church mice, or little ten stained glass windows, or uh, various other tit tat. Eventually I found some Bibles right in a corner, either children's Bibles, or uh, the ones you give to people at their confirmation or christening, you know, the little type of dinky ones that's impossible to read. I went round that cathedral looking for the gospel, looking for Jesus. I saw some crucifixes, because high church and all that. I found stuff by Amnesty International. I found stuff telling stories of different people who had been in the church and things like that. Come and join us, my friend. God bless you, brother. That's all right. Watch out for the camera behind you. I've sworn you, you're on camera. You won't, you won't be when you're sitting down. Anyway, I went around Norwich Cathedral looking, looking for the gospel, and I couldn't find it. Eventually, in this sort of dark side, in a place where they stack the spare chairs, I saw this sun bus. In the middle, that's St Paul, preaching at Athens at the Areopagus. Either side of him, you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And you've got various different scenes, I think, there from the life of Paul underneath. And the words underneath the middle one were, Whom you worship in ignorance, I preach unto you. That was the only gospel I could find. Oh, I could think of. In fact, I, I, I went searching for something, and I found another rotary bookshelf. And there was a, a leaflet on it, Who is Jesus? Aha, good stuff. Jesus was a historical character. Now, that, not a problem if it goes on from there, but it didn't. That's about as bad as it got. And I was wondering, what would St. Paul think if he walked through that door? What would those apostles think of the church, of Christianity, of what we have made of Christianity? So I decided the Book of Acts. Yeah. We've done the life of Jesus, yeah. Yeah. we've done the end bit, those of you who managed to get through to the end of the uh, yeah. end, well done, um, the, the revelations and the second coming, I'm going to join them up now, and I had intended to be systematic, I was going to work through, carefully through the gospel of, 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 of through the Acts, <laughs> laying yeah. things out, I got three words into the first chapter, and got sidetracked. So we're going to be sidetracked today. Um, if you'd like to turn to the Book of Acts for me. Uh, uh, Norwich Cathedral. 
you can actually see, you can actually look up online and see the, the different stained glass windows. Undoubtedly there's some of the life of Jesus, but you couldn't see where they were. That was in the, uh, next to what's called the choir, on the north side, in a sort of dark little section, where they stack the, stack the stairs, their chairs. So, a lot of cathedrals you go into, you won't find the Gospel, you won't find Jesus. You'll find St Benedict, you'll find various different things. You'll find lots of um, memories of people who have died on the wall, but can you find Jesus? Obviously they would say come to the services, but how many people do? How many people walk through our door? Then we come through the door here, okay, you get Jesus. But how many do? Anyway, Book of Acts. I'm going to read the first verse, and I'd like some of you to read it in different versions if you've got it. It's the first verse. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Has somebody else got a different version for that? They can read out for me. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. Maybe I've got a different version. Well, well um, our new one is here. Yep. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So you get the idea, he's talking about a former book. And the former book is actually the Gospel of Luke. I'm assuming from here on in that this Acts is written by Luke. Neither the Gospel of Luke nor Acts actually say who it's written by, but tradition and the high probability is it's written by Luke. So I'm just going to take that as a written. The first account, or the first book, any other words we've got there for book or account? Anything different? Treatise. Treatise, yeah. Good old authorised, former treatise of Theophilus. Anybody else? All of those words are translated wrong. The word is logos in Greek. Logos is literally translated word. Yes. Um, that is an utterly inadequate translation of that word. But um, So in li literally it will be the first word I composed. The first word I composed. Now we've come across this before. Those of you who did Life of Jesus with me, Let's go to John, chapter 1. We talked about this right at the beginning of Jesus' life, about four years ago. John, chapter 1. I'll just read the first five verses for you. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. He, he, was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that was come into being. And him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now we looked at that one in detail when we started the life of Jesus. Um, the Jews had a lot to say on the subject of the Logos, or for them, look at me on their notes, um, Memra was the Aramaic, which was the, the standard speech of the people who, um, around Jesus' time, Jesus would have spoken Aramaic. Um, Debar was the Hebrew. So both of those mean word. And we looked at this, and the, the rabbis talked a lot about um, the Memra, because they, they wrote a, a book in Aramaic, which was like a, uh, a, uh, a study Bible for the people at the time. It was to explain to them. And they went through the Old Testament and they looked at all the times when the word, the Debar, or the Memoir, turned up. And they said, well, the Memoir is God. But also it's separate from God. And also it's a person. Because the, the, the word of God came to someone and it was a person. 
And it was the element that caused creation, that the creation was by the word of God. And they come all these lists of things. If you'll go back to the original notes or look up the, the YouTube of the life of Jesus, we go over those. That's from the Jewish perspective. And in the first chapter of John, John ticks them all off. He goes through this list, the rabbis have come up with it. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, tick. And the word was with God. How can it be God and with God? Tick. Uh, he ticks them all off. And so the word of God, the, the Logos says in Greek, right at the beginning, it is Jesus. It is yeah. Jesus. So the word, so when we come to the book of Acts, in the beginning, or uh, uh, the former word, the former Logos, the former Jesus, it's, it's far more important than just a book. In fact, the word that's used there is not the word that's used for book in, in Greek. So it's something far deeper, far more meaningful. Let's go to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 10. I want to look to start with at the, um, the message to the Jewish people. It comes to us as well, but to the Jewish people initially, and to the church nowadays, quite frankly. So, Isaiah chapter 1, and it's 10 to 20. Someone want to read this one out for me? It's quite a long one, but... Isaiah 1, 10 to 20. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, of the of threatened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my corpse? Stop bringing me meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moon, Sabbaths, and convocations. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of hearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I'm not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. How far must I go? Keep going up to 20. Come now. Let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. See, in so, that's it. That's it. Thank you. Verse 18. I've got, come let us reason together. Anybody else got that? Or something? Yeah. Yeah. Reason together. This is the mission of Jesus to the Jewish people. The Jewish people had religion coming out of their eros. They had sacrifices. They had different ways of doing it. They had the rabbinic laws. You had loads of that. And God said, it makes me sick. What's the point of it? Where is it coming? And, and so this is God's message to Isaiah at the time. Let, let's sit down and reason together. Let's talk about this. Let, let's, and this is God's, this is the boss sitting down with a member of staff who is not following the rules. Come on, let's talk about this. Let's get this sorted out. I'm going to give you a chance. Go to the book, Gospel of John. Keep that in mind and go to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. Now, this event happens just after Jesus has basically withdrawn from the crowd and has hidden himself away. And this passage we're about to read out is effectively something that Jesus said at one stage that John has kept for this point to summarise Jesus' message 
to the Jewish people. So this is after Jesus has spent three years reasoning with the Jewish people, of sitting down and talking to them, saying, look, we've got to sort this out. This is the message that Jesus gives to the people. So if we go to uh, John 12, and uh, it's 35 to 50. I'll read it. And if you think of John 3.16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have an everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. As you read this, this is the expanded version of it. So, 35. John 12, 35. Jesus therefore said to them, For a little while longer, uh, for longer, the light of the world is amongst you. Your light is amongst you. Walk while you have the light, that darkness may not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light, in order that you may become sons of the light. These things Jesus spoke, and he departed and hid himself from them. But though they had, he had performed many signs before them, yet they did not believe in him. And the word of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which was spoken, Lord, who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this cause they could not believe, for Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes, and he has hardened their heart lest they see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be con um, converted, and I heal them. These things Isaiah said, he saw his glory and he spoke of him. 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 Who is he talking about? Nevertheless, many, even the rulers, believed in him, and because of the Pharisees they were... Uh, they were not confessing him lest they should be put out of the synagogues for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God and Jesus cried out and said he who believes in me does not believe in me but on him who sent me and he who believes in me beholds the one who sent me I have come as the light into the world that anybody who believes in me may not remain in the darkness if anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come into the world to, uh, to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is that which judges him at the last day. For I did not speak my own word of my own on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me commandments what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. That is a summary of Jesus' message to the Jewish people. I'm here. The word is here. Let's reason, let's talk about this, let's get back to God. So get back to God campaign. It's interesting. Go back a bit further. Why does Jesus come to this point of hiding himself away from the crowds? This is in Holy Week. This is, he's been in the temple, he's been preaching every day in the temple. Suddenly, he stops halfway through a day and hides himself away. And that's the last the crowd see of him until they see him nailed to the cross, or at the trial. Why? Uh, go back to uh, verse 20, so chapter 12, verse 20. Now there were certain Greeks amongst those who were coming to worship at the feast. These therefore came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came to Andrew, Andrew came to Philip, and they came and told Jesus. That was the trigger that stopped Jesus' message. The Greeks came and asked to see Jesus. Who were these Greeks? Were these complete pagans? 
No, because it says that they, they come to worship. You don't come to worship at Jerusalem if you're a pagan. So these were believers in God. But they couldn't come into the temple where Jesus was. And the reason was, is they hadn't gone the last step to join with Judaism, which were man, everyone's crossing your legs. And <laughs> <laughs> it was easier for a woman to become a Jewess than it was for a man. And a lot of people believed the, 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 the Old Testament scriptures, but they wouldn't go that final step, especially as it was condemned and generally looked down upon by the whole of the Roman and Greek world. So they were called um, uh, proselytes of the gate, or believers of the gate, and that they were allowed to come up to a certain gate in the temple and had to stop. So that was the court of the Gentiles. You went through that to the court of the women, you went through that to the court of the men, you went through that into the, the main court of the temple. They were allowed to come up to that outer gate. So they were proselytes um, of the gate. They hadn't gone all the way. Jesus was somewhere inside. So they wanted to get to Jesus, they couldn't get to him. And so they purloined a passing disciple. Wait, can we have a word with Jesus out here? Can he come and see us? Because Jesus was inside somewhere. Solomon, a portico of Solomon. I don't know where that was in the temple, but that's one of Jesus' favourite hangouts in the temple where he was preaching. Now I wonder, that there's no accidents in the Bible. Why did this particular thing make Jesus stop? What, what was it about this? Now I, I thought, now, I put some... There's one from Isaiah there. If you look at your notes, Isaiah 2, and it's the Gentile world saying, let us go up to the house of the Lord. You don't have to look it up, but you can do. Let's read it. I might, it's halfway there, let's read it. If nothing else in this session, you will find out your way around the Bible. Isaiah chapter 2, so just after the bit we've written, just after it, or we've read earlier on. Isaiah chapter 2, and it was uh, 1 to 3. And the word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it will come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains, and will be raised up above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his path. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Pretty good verse. Pretty good verse. Is that it? Is that the one that spurred Jesus on? I mean, that's, to be honest, that's going to happen at the end. When Jesus eventually returns and reigns, that is going to happen there. That is what is Jesus' mind. But is that the verse that Jesus here thought, oh, these Gentiles have come to speak to me, I've therefore got to give up and effectively go to the cross? I don't think so. Go to Kings, 1 Kings. It's interesting that Jesus' favourite hangout was at the portico of Solomon. So 1 Kings chapter 8. And this is the prayer that Solomon made at the dedication of the first temple. Um, after he made, he made this great big long, you think prayers can be long nowadays, you should sit and read through this prayer. It's a big long prayer, obviously written out in advance, so he, he got it all right. It's 40 to 43. <coughs> Who would like to read this one out for me? So that they will fear you and all the time they live in the land you gave your fa our fathers. As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people, Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, for men will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when he comes and prays towards his temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place and do whatever the foreigner asks of you, but that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your own people Israel, and may know that this house I've built bears your name. So when the foreigner comes for hearing of you and prays, give them what they ask. What do they ask? We would see Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's what was in Jesus' mind. Mm -hmm. 
And at that point, that's the... Obviously, God had told him, when this comes, that's the sign. Mm -hmm. And that's where Jesus stops being a prophet mm -hmm. and becomes a priest. And he offers a sacrifice, which in this case is his own life. Yeah. Jesus has three phases, if you like. Prophet, priest, king. Mm -hmm. At the moment, he's in the priestly phase. So we've got Greeks here. Let's go back to Acts. So the book of Acts is written by Luke. Now Luke was either a Greek who was converted, or he was a, a Greek who first converted to Judaism and then converted to Christianity, or probably more likely he was a, um, a Jew of the dispersion, so a diaspora, so that's a Jew who's not living in Israel. So you've got Jews today living in America, you've got them over here, they're the Jews of the, okay, if you go to Canada you've got lots of Hasidic Jews down there. They are Jews of the dispersion. Jews of the, the uh, diaspora. So more likely, Luke was a Jew of the diaspora who was then converted. The reason I say that is because he has a very good knowledge of Judaism. A very good knowledge of Judaism. It also has a very good knowledge of the Greek world. Um, this book is written to Theophilus. Theophilus. In the book of Luke, there's an extra word. Can anybody remember it? Those of you? Ah, oh, here's a test for you. There's an extra word. There's an extra word. He doesn't say Theophilus, he says something else. Yeah. Most excellent Theophilus. Yes. Most yes. excellent yes. Theophilus. That was an official title. In the same way you might say, my lord, or your honour, or something like that here. That was an official title. Mm -hmm. And in the book of Acts, it's used a couple of times. Actually, we won't look it up, because you'll notice we here all night. You notice my wife put the watch beside me to try to slow, slow me down. Because <laughs> I forgot my watch. It won't work. Amen. Actually, Acts 26, I'll just, read, uh, I'll, I'll just tell you what it is. When the Apostle Paul is arrested, and he is sent to the governor Felix, the centurion writes the letter and says, Most excellent Felix. And then when G Paul is talking to him, he's most excellent Felix. And then when the next guy comes on Festus, most excellent Festus. So to say most excellent means that that person is at least the level in the Roman authorities as a governor. So Theophilus was in some form a governor in the Roman Empire, in some section of the Roman Empire. Now my belief is he's actually based in Rome, um, and the probability is that Paul got to know him while he was in prison in Rome. It might even be that Theophilus was in charge of Paul while he was in Rome. And he got interested in the, the, the story of Jesus. So he firstly commissions Luke to write the Gospel. And then now, uh, Luke now writes this second section. Basically how the Gospel got from this little backwater of Judah to Rome, where Theophilus was. Now that's a, a, a possible understanding of it. It's interesting that in the Acts, it doesn't say most excellent Theophilus. I wonder if he lost his job in the meantime. Oh, if he'd become a Christian, in the Roman Empire, you became, you got your job by bribery and corruption. You paid to get your job. If he became a Christian and wasn't willing to go into bribery and corruption, I wonder if he lost his job. He was a doctor, Luke, wasn't he? Quite, yes. Uh, we definitely know that Luke was a physician. Um, we assume that Luke, that, or we, we work out that Acts and Luke were written by him because there's words in Greek that are found nowhere else in the Gospel. It's a very high quality Greek and it's words that are used a, a lot in medical writings at the time. Um, and it was someone who travelled, as we'll see later on, it's someone who travelled with the Apostle Paul and we know that Luke did travel with Paul. So they put two and two together, they put tradition with it and they said Luke. So I would say 90 to 95% certain. But if it turns out to be written by somebody completely different that none of us have ever heard of, I don't think it makes any difference at all. In fact, all the Gospels don't have a name on them. None of the Gospels have a name on them. It's all names that we've gotten by tradition. But, anyway. Go to Ephesians. We were in Ephesians today in the, in the church. Chapter 3. Ephesians, Paul gets rather excited and gets carried away with lots of words. It's so after about chapter 3 he calms down a bit. So we're going to read chapter 3, 1 to 6. 
there's something interesting here. Up to this point, the, the gospel as such, the good news of the kingdom has been for the Jewish people only. So how come now it's suddenly going to go out to the outside world? So it's uh, Ephesians chapter 3 and it's 1 to 6. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ, for your sake, you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard the stewardship of the God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery. Have you got the word mystery there? Yeah. Mystery. Yeah. The mystery as I wrote before in brief. And by, uh, and by referring to this, you, uh, you will read, you will understand my insight into the mysteries of Christ, which in other generations were not made known to the sons of man, as has been revealed to the holy to the holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit. In to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Jesus Christ through the gospel. Mystery. Now, to us, a mystery is something you don't know the answer to. In the Bible, it's slightly different. A mystery is something that wasn't revealed in the Old Testament but has been revealed in the New Testament. So it's something different from we understand it. So when we look at the mystery, oh, we don't understand it. So a, a mystery here, well, why wouldn't God reveal it? Why wouldn't God tell the, the Old Testament prophets, one day my son's going to die for you and then the whole world's going to be all brought in together. So are Gentiles and Jews, I mean, there's hints, but that's not specifically there. Why not? <clears throat> Answer comes... Uh, 1 Corinthians. Go to 1 Corinthians. Uh, chapter 2. Satan knew what Jesus was about. He knew the Bible. He had read Isaiah 53, where it talks about the suffering servant who dies and, uh, and is brought back. He's, he's, he understands the idea of Jesus dying on a cross, or dying on a tree, something like that, and forgiving people their sins. And he did his best to get Jesus killed before the cross. He tried to get him killed by Herod when he was a baby. He tried to get him thrown off a cliff in his own hometown. He tried to get the Pharisees to kill him. He tried to get the priests to kill him. He wanted him dead at any time apart from on the cross, on the Passover. But anyway, he probably knew he couldn't stop that. What he didn't know is what God was going to do with that afterwards. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and it's verses 6 to 9. <coughs> Yet we do not speak wisdom amongst those, those who are mature, a wisdom however not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. The rulers there would refer to Satan as well. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The hidden wisdom, which God predestined before the ages of his glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. God didn't tell Satan what his plan was, for a very good reason. The plan was... You're, you're a, a disciple of the gate. You can only come to the gate. There's a wall between you and the presence of God. The gospel says it knocks down that central wall of partition. And suddenly the Jews and the Gentiles can now, the gospel can go to them. The news, the word can go to all of them. And it doesn't matter what you are or who you are. That was God's plan. That was the plan that Satan didn't know. If he had known it, he probably would have left Jesus to live a natural life. Because it wouldn't have done this. So, we're now looking at a letter written in Greek to Theophilus, who was either Roman or Greek or spoke in Greek. So I'm going to look at the Greek meaning of the word logos. And you've got it written down here. Logos. A chap called Aristotle was speaking to Logos. In fact, most of the Greek philosophers liked their Logos. Logos. Words, discourse or reason 
an appeal to rational discourse that relies on induction and deductive reasoning. In other words, let's think this out. Let's sit down and go through the facts and work this out. This is what Logos meant to the Greek world. Um, sit down and carefully go through things. Carefully work it out. I mean, you, you've probably done that. Let's sit down and work this out. Don't go on gut emotions. Work it out. That's Logos. <clears throat> go to Acts 17. This is the Apostle Paul in Athens. The home of Greek reasoning, the home of all the, um, the philosophers, a sort of different philosophers. And he is grabbed by a bunch of these guys and taken to something called the Areopagus, which used to be the parliament of the Greek world. Um, in the past, that's where all big decisions were made and things like that. They were the ones who enjoyed it. By this stage, it become a bit of a talking shop because the, the Romans had basically taken over. And they were the ones in charge, but the, <coughs> this was basically a lot of people who got time on their hands, people with time on their hands who wanted to have a chat. And they caught Paul out in the, um, the marketplace preaching. And they didn't know what he was preaching about. Two things, Jesus and the resurrection. And they said, you're preaching strange gods, plural, gods. So the resurrection was a god. In the Greek world, you didn't get resurrected. You went down to Hades or worse, and that was it. You never come back again. Uh, who is this Jesus guy? I don't know who he is. He's preaching strange gods. Let's drag him. So they literally dragged him into the area of Arbus, where they're all sitting there listening. And he stands in front of them and has to give a defence. Now, it might sound like it's a talking shop, he can talk. But preaching strange gods in Athens could get you killed. There was one uh, philosopher who was forced to drink hemlock because he, he was said to be preaching strange gods. So even if this talking shop was interested in having him bumped off, there were plenty of enemies that Paul had who were more than happy to use that as an excuse to get him killed. So he was actually preaching for his life here. Now while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him for he beheld the city full of idols. So he was reasoning, reasoning, reasoning. Remember that Isaiah, let us reason together. In the synagogue with the Jews and with the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day, uh, those who happened to be present. And some were of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers who were conversing with him. And some were saying, what does this idol Babylon wish to say? Others, he seems to be proclaiming strange deities. <coughs> because he is preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know these new teachings in which you, you are proclaiming, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears, and we want to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visited there used to spend all their time in nothing other than telling and hearing some strange new <coughs> thing. It's now called the internet. <laughs> And Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said to the men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects, for while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I noticed an, old, an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. What therefore you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. That's reason. He's reasoning with them. He's in danger here of his life, but he's reasoning with them. He's using logic, he's using intelligence. There's other cases where um, Paul appears before Governor Felix, who I'm looking up, but he says he, he, Paul reasoned <coughs> with him about justice um, and righteousness and judgment to come. He was reasoning with him. And later on, when he's standing before um, Festus as well, I think, or uh, King Agrippa, he is reasoning with them. Logically reasoning. So he is using Greek methods in a Greek world. If you look at uh, Aristotle's next one down, ethos. You have a good ethos. You heard that expression before? Someone has a good ethos? Mm -hmm. Persuasion through uh, convincing listeners of one moral character. If someone's a good person, 
you are more likely to listen to them than if someone's a bad person unless they stand for five minutes to and then you vote them in. <laughs> Not that moral character just means you're a good leader, but this is one of their arguments. Someone who is morally upright and is arguing for something is a better person to listen to than someone who is a known liar. Makes sense. Remember Jesus said, let your light shine amongst men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So this is a Christian, a Christian virtue. Um, proven moral character in Romans there. That's what Paul talks about have proven moral character. He's writing to the Romans. So that people who can listen to you can see your proven moral character. So here we have, once again, Paul using a Greek philosophy, Greek idea, in the way he's arguing. And Jesus himself does. And it's quite right. How much of Christianity has been destroyed because the person standing at the top turned out to be yeah. sleeping yeah. with the choir boys? Yeah. Literally. Yeah. And how much of Christianity has been destroyed because of that? Because the people who are at the top are not a model. That's right. Pathos. Pathos. <clears throat> Persuasion by means of emotional appeal. Now, to be honest, I get a bit dubious about some, um, some sermons which are all emotion and all froth for no substance. But it was used. At the book, so, um, at the um, Pentecost, when Peter preached, what did it say? It said that the people said they were pierced to the heart. That's ooh, it gets you inside. So that's the, the Apostle Peter preaching through the power of the Holy Spirit. Ooh, it's emotional. It's got you inside. You've got in Acts as well, Pete, um, the Apostle Paul in twenty. He says he, he was preaching, I was preaching to you day and night with weeping. He's talking to some of the elders. He's weeping. He's crying. Because he knows that when he leaves, there's other people going to come in. It's going to muck up his teaching. Mm. And he said, don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. And it, it was in him. So, is the, the gospel now to be spread to the world by means of Greek philosophy? The answer to that question is no, by the way. Turn to Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, chapter 2. Someone like to read this one out for me? And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, or proclaim unto you the testimony about God, for I result of to know nothing when I was with you except Jesus Christ, and him crucified, I came to you in weakness with a great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching in were not wise to persuasive word, but with a demonstration of sp the Spirit's power, and with your faith might not what rest human wisdom and God's power. We do not, however, speak a message with wisdom among the mature, for but not the wisdom of this age, or the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. Yeah. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, and a wisdom that has been hidden, and God, dis and God destined for our, own for our own glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, but if they had, they would not have a crucified the, the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For the, who among men knows the thoughts of the man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of the of who is my from God. We may understand what God has freely given us. This is, this is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in the words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in the spiritual words. 
The man whose spirit it is not accept these things that come from the Spirit of God for our foolishness to him. Those are our foolishness to him. We, we cannot understand them because we are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all the things that he himself is not subject to any of man's judgment. For who know for who has known the mind of the Lord, may he instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. It's not by the earthly wisdom. So it's not by Greek philosophy. No. It's not by the Greek understanding of logos. It's not by what Aristotle or any of his cronies come up with. This is a wisdom of God. <coughs> it's, that's the way it comes out. Go to John 16. John 16. 1 to 15. This is the Last Supper. This is Jesus' words to his disciples when he was instructing them before he left and instructing them for the mission that he was giving them. So from verse 1. These things I have spoken to you that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God. These things they will, they will do because they do not know the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you that when the hour comes you may remember what I have told you. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me and none of you asked me where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I should go away. For if I do not go away, the helper shall not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. And he will come. Uh, when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will no longer behold me and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged I have many more things to say to you but you cannot bear them now but when he the spirit of truth comes he will guide you in all truth and he will speak not speak of his own initiative initiative but whatever he hears he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine and shall disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I say that he shall take of mine and disclose it to you. Earthly wisdom. But the Bible also says that the, the wisdom of God is foolishness to this age. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard the expression clowns with Christ? Or being a fool for Christ? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Being a fool for Christ. When the message was taken out to the world, the pe um, one, one group of people said, the people who are turning the world upside down have come here also. There was an old song we used to sing, like that. didn't even sing it. We'll be turning the world upside down. Um, it doesn't mean it's going to be wonderful you want to look up the next bit Jesus says in Matthew he says to his disciples I am sending you out as among sheep amongst wolves so this is a foolishness to the world it's wisdom to God go to John 15 let me assume John now John 15 12 to 12, 17. This is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for a slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. 
For all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask in my Father's name, he will give you. This I command you, that you love one another. Why have I put that one in? That may be lovely. Friends. Do you know what Theophilus means? It's on your notes. <coughs> Theophilus in Greek means lover of God, someone loved by God, friend of God. Acts was written to a man who was called the friend of God. Ah, Theophilus is long since dead and gone to heaven, hopefully. It's now written to us. If you're a friend of God today, because he loves you, God so loved the world. If you love God, then you become his friends. So the book of Acts, the word, the word that started in the Gospels, the living word of Jesus Christ that started in the Gospels, is still going now. It's still coming to Tbilisi all these years later. Look on the last page. We'll end with one more reading. Genesis. Genesis 15. Often you can find out a way uh, a, a word is used in the Bible by looking for the first time it is actually used. And that often sets the, the tone for how it's to be read in the rest of the Bible. This is the first time that the, the word, the devar in Hebrew, is mentioned in the Bible. After these things... The word, the devar, the logos of the Lord, came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abraham. I am a shield, and your great and your reward shall be very great. And Abraham said, O Lord, what will you give me, since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, Since thou hast given me no offspring, one born in my house is to be my heir. Then, behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man shall not be your heir, but one who shall come from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside, and he looked up towards heaven, and said, Count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. Yes. The word came, Abraham believed righteousness. That's what the word of God is. It's not a book. It's not a religious system. No. It's not a couple of statues in a, a big person. building. It's a, person. it's a person. It's the word of God. It's the wisdom of God. It's the holiness of God. It's the justice of God. That is what we are supposed to be preaching. Yes. When I walked into that cathedral, where was uh, it? God. When people walk into our church, that's what they should see. When they come into our lives, that's what they should see. You can't point fingers at others, because there's three pointing back. Yeah. It's us. Yeah. The Word of God is a living Word of God. It's not this. It's not logic. It's not an obey, uh, rules for living a good life. No. It's not an emotion. It's a person. It's a person who should be in us. And that's what we should be preaching. And that's what we should be taking to the world that desperately needs it. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I had intended to do a big long session today laying out how the book of Acts is divided out and the various different sections of it. And I didn't get more than three words in. Well, I think, I think the Holy Spirit is in his way. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit, it's not us. Yeah, it's, 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 the, it's the combined combination. Yes. Yes. So any other questions? Well, the Greek uh, council, um, were they also looking at scientific things? The Greeks were looking at... Yeah, they, they were into philosophy. Just philosophy, only. Yeah, I think so, yeah. So it was... 
Well, it's like those sort of talking shops nowadays. We have very intelligent, clever people sitting down talking about the latest, whatever the latest happens to be. So, it's not, not the equipment to pipe, testing out Pythagoras or anything like that. I don't think they probably would have taught mathematics and things like that as well. So basically, they were um, was it Renaissance men? We call them nowadays people who know everything. A bit like Stephen Fry, who knows absolutely everything about everything, but nothing about what's important. Uh, um, it's. I, I get things. So certainly in the past, but I think there's the Areopagus who can who condemned the other um, philosopher to death. And, you know, girls, which philosopher was it who got forced to drink hemlock? Socrates. Socrates, I think. Something. Like that. <coughs> those who know the ancient Greek. Are probably, those who know an ancient Greek are probably annoyed with me now because I don't know these things. But <laughs> let's let's finish with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you are the living word of God and that you live in our hearts, not in the pages of a dusty old book, not in the fabric of an old building. But Lord, you are the living embodiment of the Lord God and it's in our lives. Lord, and may that light, that word and that light shine out from us so that others may see it and others may know it and be persuaded, Lord. Reason with others through us. We know it won't be easy. We know it's costly. But Lord, we know where we are going. And we want to take as many people with us as we can. Lord, work through us. Amen. And amen. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.